right. Baruch atah adinai denim lechelam shahakul niya bidvarei. Amen. L'chaim, l'chaim everybody. L'chaim to life. And this is life right here. And we come together to learn together. That is real life. But where life is on the balance, so um, our, we need to reach out and help those that need help. Our brothers and sisters who are on the front lines in, in Israel, our hearts go out to them. I would like to begin with actually a prayer. I'm going to pass around. Okay, I'll pass maybe half on that side. So, it'll, okay. all right. Um, I don't know if I have enough of them. We're going to do Psalm 122 for our brothers. We're going to do it in Hebrew. We have the transliteration here. We have uh, the English for those who want to do it in English, by all means. A heartfelt prayer at this time is necessary. Okay. Shir Hamaloit le David. We can all say together. Shir Hamaloit le David Samachti Ba Omri Mali Base Adinai Nele. I'm Days Hayu Raglenu Isha Arayich Yushalayim Yushalayim Habanuya Kiir Shehubra La Yachta. Shisham Olu Shvatim Shifte Ya Ada Isla Yisrael La Haida Isla Shem Adinai Kishama Yashvu Kisais Le Mishpat Kisais Leves David Shalu Yushalayim Shalom Yushalayim Yishalu Ayavayach Yi Shalom Bechelech Shalva Baarmano Yisayach Laman Achai Verei Adabra No Shalom Bach Laman base adinai lehenu avaksha toy lah. Let me speak of the peace in your midst for the sake of your house, Lord of our God. I will request your good. Okay. So welcome to the world of Kabbalah. Here, actually, you don't. Everybody here doesn't see. So just a quick, you know, you can say hello, everybody. <laughs> wow. A lot of people. Great. Hi. <laughs> yes. So um, this is the first time that we're doing JLI. Oops. See that? You touch something. Then. There we go. The first time that we're doing a hybrid of um, online and here for a JLI. So you'll excuse me if I am a little not so adept to things trying our, our first time. So welcome to the world of Kabbalah. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity where you're all going to be trained to be Jewish mystics. That's how you're going to leave tonight a little bit, but after six weeks, a lot of it. <laughs> we begin with the very word Kabbalah. What comes to mind in two or three words when we say the word Kabbalah? Who could share? Anybody? Safed. Mysticism. Revealing the nature of God. Revealing the nature of God. Very good. Huh? Gematria. Okay. Numerology. Esoteric. Esoteric. Very good. Anybody else? Mel? Wisdom. Wisdom. Excellent. Learning. Learning, okay, great. To receive, to receive, oh, to receive. The Rabbi word Kabbalah Akiva. actually means to receive. Although all the Torah is received at Mount Sinai, is the first Mishnah in Pirkei Avot in the Ethics of Our Fathers that Moses received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Kibel Kabbalah, he received. It's true. It's all received from on high. But there's something unique about the Kabbalah that it is more, shall we say, remains a lofty, mystical, on high, being a recipient of, rather than the other parts of Torah where there's a greater engagement of 
shall we say, uh, the mind in a certain way. But we'll get, we'll see that it's not so simple. So uh, I think you've all said it. Um, let us get to the screen share over here, and I hope we'll be able to do this well. What do you see there? You see, not a good screen share, or yeah, looks good. You can the uh, zoom over. Yeah. Oops. No. There you go. All right. Is that good? Yeah. Clear. Okay. All right. So look at that. Okay. So in this course, we're going to gain answers to. Oops. Actually, no. It's. Not a good share because it's not giving me the opportunity. Let's see if this is better. Moment, please. Hmm. Rabbi, if you just set it to slideshow, it should be good. Right. Okay, we got it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, driving questions. Okay. Someone. <laughs> oh, because you're... you're... <laughs> So what is Kabbalah? That would be a driving question. What is its central teachings? What is the significance of some of the key terms like Sfirot? Very important that we get terminology down. And how are these teachings relevant to our lives? Which that will be actually one of the most crucial questions that we will deal with. It's a beautiful story told of the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe, that he had one of his Hasidim came in, who was a very devout, learned individual in the esoteric, Kabbalistic, Hasidic tradition. And he asked him about his daily schedule. He says, what do you do before your prayer service? Well, I learn uh, mystical Hasidic teachings. And what do you do during your prayers? Well, I think about it. I think about, you know, what I learned and about, you know, God and 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 so on. It says, and after you learn, what do you uh, what do you do? It says then I take what I've prayed with and I try to think about it uh, throughout the day. And then at nighttime when you go to sleep, what are you thinking about? It says further. So he says he thinks like he's giving all the right answers. And the Rebbe Marash Reb Shmuel says to him, "Tell me." When do you have time to think about for yourself, about yourself? He heard those words, he fainted. Meaning, it's one thing to think about abstract and even godly things and to think about God. But what's crucially important is anything that you learn in the mystical, if it re remains a mystical idea, as opposed to that it's translated into daily living, it's missing the point. So very important, whatever we're going to be discussing here is that we're going to bring it down to the here and now that it will be part of our daily routine on how we can take the message of mystical Kabbalistic teachings and not leave it transcendent, but that we should be empowered for our growth. That's the goal, the ultimate goal in the gate in daily routine. Okay. So let's begin the journey. Let's take a quick glance at some of the classic Kabbalistic works. Over here you have Rav Moshe Kodavero, Pardis Rimoinim, known as the Ramak, for those who are familiar with some Kabbalistic individuals. The Ramak. 
He was a, uh, he belonged to the mystical circle that lived in Sfat. He was before the Arizal, a teacher of, uh, of the Arizal and others. And um, his famous work, Hardest Reminding. Then we have here Rav Shavtai Halevi Horowitz. Also a 16th century uh, sage, renowned as his uh, father was, best known for his work, Shefatal. Okay, now those diagrams will be constantly appearing in Kabbalistic literature, these kind of diagrams. Why? Why would there be diagrams? Well, what's the old adage? One picture tells a thousand words. So sometimes when you put things into words, words are abstract because, right? But when you see it visually, then an abstract idea can become more real for the individual, right? So therefore we have that. Now, with that then, we can understand that Kabbalah seeks to accomplish this by turning to the human character. The human character. Even though the Kabbalah spends a lot of time on focusing on God, but it spends a lot of time exploring who we are. Because when you understand the human personality and character, the human soul, that becomes the optimal tool that we can learn and appreciate aspects of God. Aspects of God that would be otherwise too abstract if we weren't able to understand ourselves. So text number one, please. From the Toldus Yaakov, page six in your book, or booklet. Um, give me that booklet. Thank you. Jason, the last turn. And uh, give this to Hannah. Okay. Welcome, sir. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Amwa. A mortal is a mirror for the supernal reality. All that exists in both higher and lower realms is present in the microcosm, cosmic form within the human. This is a deeper significance of the Torah statement that the human was created in the divine image. And that is why we say, from my flesh, I envision God. So the human character and soul can teach us about God. Why? Why? How can it teach us about God? God is all in all. Because we are in the image of God, as we just said, right? We have a piece of God in us. So if we can understand that piece in us, that image in us, then we can understand him. Right? Like, you see that with kids, right? How often do you see, you know, I have 10 kids. So I see that how some are like me this way, some are like my wife in another way, you know, all the good things <laughs> that every parent thing, right, comes from me, <laughs> from her. <laughs> and the point is, being that they come from you, so therefore, you can see the image of you in them. By the way, smart kids, when they grow up, they realize how they become their parents. First, they, as we will learn more, they think not that way. But when they grow up, truly grow up, they see otherwise. Now, really, that is counterintuitive, this notion. Why is it counterintuitive? Because God is infinite and we are finite. finite. So therefore, there's such a huge gap between us. Does it make sense to say that there's a way that through us that we can know him? But that's the beauty of being created in his image. That's the beauty that we have a piece of God in us. That therefore we have the capacity by knowing us, right? We can know God. Now, from a rock, that's a little difficult. From an animal, that's also difficult. Can you know that God is a creator? Yes. But can you know the nature of God? Not really. Because they're not created. Sorry, dog lovers but they're not created in the image of God. Is that clear? Can you know of it, God's presence in the world? Absolutely. You just have to look at a leaf and how magnificent a simple leaf is. And you can know for certain that there is a creator to this universe.
But the nature of that creator, the quality of that nature, anything about the, you won't know. But from the human, you will. Is that clear? Okay. So let's now get into understanding a little about us. <laughs> and hopefully from there, we'll be able to... Um, So um, you want the good news or the bad news? So the bad news, the yesterday, <laughs> the bad news is that yesterday, my dear son Mendel and his wife Shana and their five kids who lived four doors away from us moved away. Right. They're here in Montreal. They moved into a temporary dwelling because they were bought a new home closer to here so they could be literally um, a stone's throw away from here, right? I'll take a look, right? What motivated them to do that? I mean, there's a lot of motivation, but a home, what motivates, what's the first motivator, right? In an individual, what, what is it? The first motivation to have security? That's a negative one. Positive one. Yeah, oh. Closer? Pleasure. Pleasure. No pleasure. The pleasure of having your own home includes security, right? Security is under that umbrella, right? No one is seeking security merely. The pleasure that we have in a home includes security, right? So the first thing that we have, right, is security. What, I mean, a pleasure. What does that trigger once you have the, the pleasure of the notion? And that's why they, you know, a bigger home, a nicer home, a more renovated home, right? That's a pleasure, right? What does that trigger, the, the pleasure? I might have gotten away already. A desire. I want. Because of the pleasure thereof, that triggers a desire that I want. I want this home. Right? What does then the desire prompt? Will. Desire and will are the same thing. Same idea. No. No. Action. You start thinking. Using your mind. The pros and the cons of this home, this home versus another home, right? You start using the intellectual process first to justify you would because you have a pleasure and you have a will. Does that mean a justification? Not a justification. So it's got to be logically, you know, meet through the, the mind of the individual. Now, after you did that, what happens? Where does that go? After the analytical pros and cons. Next stage is? Oh, now you're feeling an emotional attachment, not just pleasure. Pleasure isn't emotions, right? We shouldn't mix the two together, right? You feel an, an emotional attachment, right, after that. And then after the emotional attachment, then what happens? You start, now you're really thinking of it. Why? What do you think of? The things that you have a an emotional, strong feeling towards, right? You That's what you think about so you revisit it you rethink it time and time again and then from there where does it go to something called speech from thinking then it goes into speech we start talking about it after we've developed it in our minds and our thoughts we start talking with talk with professionals we talk with friends with advisors and so on and then finally what do we do we act upon it <laughs> right that's the process that we need to go through, right? And this is it in having a home. The desire, justify the endeavor logically. We explore the options of how it make, would make us feel. We rethink the plan, go over and over in our heads. Then we speak it over with others. And finally, we make the handshake with the general contractor or the person that we're buying the home from and we sign on the dotted line, Right? So we're going to examine the areas of human character throughout this course. 
relevant now, what's going to be relevant now is to understand how God created the world and through that creation, how that applies to us. So how do you create the world? First verse in the Torah, in the beginning, right? Bereshi's bara, right? Voila. And God had from the pleasure that he envisioned, the desire that he had comes now a world. Now, that world, as we're going to learn, is a very sophisticated system that has different uh, levels and stages. Let's go to text number two on page seven, please. God fashioned the ladder planted on the earth whose top reaches into the heavens. This ladder, ladder's rungs, serve as channels through which the flow of divine energy can devolve degree after degree in a constant pattern of progressive coarsening until the flow can be received at the lowest extreme of existence. Okay, so when you study any kind of discipline, you need to become familiar with the basic language. So we're here we're going to introduce a Kabbalistic term right now, and that is in on page seven, the key term, 1.1. The Hebrew term is seder hishtalsholus. Not an easy word to say. You have it there in transliteration. It means a system of devolution. Not evolution, because evolution means progressively greater. Devolution means the opposite, right? Many degrees, it's like a chain. The word shalshelis means a change. Hishtalsholus is a chain that is the emphasis on the descent that is going from a higher level to a lower level okay now let's return to our question we asked what is kabbalah and what is its central teachings we asked the question right so kabbalah at this point what we're explaining is it's a sophisticated exploration of the order of devolution right from the highest to the lowest. Okay. That's what we're going to understand. So, for example, like I don't understand computers too well, but if you understand, you know, the operating system, the inner workings of a computer, um, how it operates, so then you can see how you can, how it devolves perhaps, right, from just a zeros and ones and whatever it is to that you have something on your screen or if you are a um, biologist and you examine the human genome so you can then understand the inner workings of the human being so that explains the diagrams that we have in the kabbalah books because that's intended to give us the hierarchy of understanding so we can take something that's esoteric very high and lofty and see how it devolves into something that is uh, more simple, shall we say. That's Seder Stalschulz. Okay. So, which then prompts us to spend a moment on the house of the Kabbalistic studies. Text number three, please, from the Alter Rebbe, founder of the Chabad movement. The saintly Rabbi Israel Bel Shem Tov taught that when studying the works of Kabbalah, we must be careful not to perceive the Kabbalistic ideas as literal, physical concepts. So here, talking about Seder Ishtalshalus, right? So it is a non-material reality. We're not talking about materialism in the physical world here, right? So we have to be careful to avoid making it in our minds, you know, in, in a concrete way, because then we will lose the notion of what it is. Really what it is, is a spiritual sense, right? We have to understand it in its spiritual sense. <clears throat> so when we say higher, we don't mean physically higher, right? Obviously. We mean, what do we mean? Spiritually higher. Spiritually higher right. We mean spiritually higher. Right. All right. So, why is this study important? In other words, to study the, the Seder Hishtal the order of devolution, 
So on one level, on a theological level, because that way we can learn about God and his ways. We can know something about him. And actually, Maimonides, in the very first teachings of Maimonides, he says that it is a the foundation of all foundations and the pillar of all wisdom is to know God. Not to believe in God, but to know God. So that is the first point, that we can know God. But then there is also to better understand the world that we live in. And because it devolves from on high to below. So if we can understand that process, we can understand the choices in life that we have and how to make better choices, right? Just like, you know, when you're buying a computer, if you know, understand the inner workings of a computer, then you can make a better choice and what's the, you know, the computer that's going to work best for you and so on, right? Now, ultimately, by understanding the world that God creates, what else are we going to understand? Ourselves. Ourselves. But here's the kicker. It's not only a devolution that we can understand how things devolve into the, into the making of this world, but we will understand how we can affect and influence what happens above. Which we're going to learn more about. In other words... We're not going to digress, uh, go off on this point right now. But what that means is, is the fate, our fate, on one hand is in the hands of heaven. On the other hand, it's totally in our hands. We affect and influence what happens above. But to do that, you need to understand the order of devolution. So then you can indeed affect above. If you don't understand the linkage, then you won't be able to appreciate and know, in fact, how you do affect above. Okay, any questions? Online, any questions? We're all good? All right. Either I'm so clear. <laughs> Or you just are embarrassed to ask, <laughs> or you're so uh, it's so unclear <laughs> that you don't even know what to ask. <laughs> Why is, important? is there something that says how you could improve yourself? Like, well, that's what you said. Make better choices. Well, okay, but that's a well. We didn't explain. We didn't go there better yet. To understand yourself better. It's not just those choices. It's better to know yourself, to feel yourself. Uh, it's not necessarily a choice, but just to understand. Well, I mean, I, it's it's all very intuitive that we should know ourselves, right? But to know the devolution of how God creates the world, right? And to understand that in order that we can know ourselves better because we are, as because we're a reflection of it, right? So then we're going to understand ourselves better. But, it, but the kicker over here is not only we're going to understand ourselves better, but not, and not only that we can make better and healthier choices in life because we will follow the, 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 the Seder he shouts for the way God creates the world, right? But we even affect above. In other words, it doesn't just affect our lives, it affects even beyond our lives. And it, not only the physical world does it affect, but even affects the spiritual world and affects, as we will learn more, you know, God Himself. But we're going to leave that for the moment. We're not there yet. Okay. Right? It's a process. <laughs> yes. You just said that uh, I have a big grief and you changed uh, Siddhartha and Shiva. Sometimes changing the name. You're going, you're getting ahead. You're so, getting ahead. What is this connection with the last? So the without Kabbalah, that statement is pure faith. Kabbalah gives us the understanding how Tfilat Tzedakul, right, um, uh, and Shuva, that they annul the decree, gives us an understanding on the pathways on how those things work. Methodology. The, me the methodology on how, in fact, it does work, rather than, well, you know, it's declared, it's stated that way, and therefore we take it on faith. The teachings here are going to give us the awareness, the knowledge, right, and therefore greater tools on, in fact, how we affect above. 
exactly. Okay, yes. Can one look at the metaphor if I have a spring and I have a weight and pull it from above? When I pull it, I apply force to above. When above pulls me, it applies force to bring me up. So we inherently connect it. Right, very good, excellent. Okay, excellent. Okay, okay. So we start today with the map from the very bottom of the map, right? And we're gonna we're starting today bottoms up, and we're gonna go higher and higher with each class. Okay. We start with the worlds called Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya. Text number four, please, on page nine. This is from the Zohar. God's glory includes Bria. And God bestowed this unto the human. God's glory includes Yitzira, another world, second world. And God bestowed this unto the human. God's glory includes Asiya, and God bestowed this unto the human. Thus, the human is rendered in the image of the supernal glory. Okay. So we had three terms over here. Bara, Yitzira, Yatsar means the fashion so created, and Yesia comes from it, Asa, to make. So if you look in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, in creation, you're going to see these three terms when it comes to God creating the world. Okay? Here we use it as a term of a noun, but in the story of creation, they're verbs. They represent three spiritual worlds and are also present in our lives, these three dimensions. Again, because being in the image of God that we're created, right? Later, we're going to see the corresponding of the microcosm of the human traits, that they are of thought, speech, and action. But quick reference. Let's go to page 10. Term, key term, number two, 1.2. The Hebrew term, Bia. It's an acronym for Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya. Created, shaped, made. Three worlds. Why do these three worlds exist? What are they all about? What transpires in those worlds? <laughs> there, were, there, were, there are complete worlds. Spiritual worlds, not physical worlds, right? So the basic level of creation introduced physical matter into creation. Before there was anything, what was there? No thing, just God, right? So before creation, there wasn't a dust particle. There wasn't a... Um, Soup mix, <laughs> there was nothing. No, not nothing like dark ho black hole, because that's a something. It's a dark hole, black hole, right? There was no thing at all, but just God. So after creation, all of a sudden, now there's a something, right? That's the first part in creation. Then the second shift was in creation introduced after there's now something in Hebrew that's called yeshus, ye yeshut, which means existence. Whether it's a physical or spiritual, whether it's uh, mundane or sacred, right? What means that there's now a something, what does that mean? It has a self-concept. Before, before Bereshis or bara, right? Creating a something that was no thing. There was no self-concept because it was only but God. It was only a reality of God. Now, in the first part of creation, there's lofty angels and souls. They're lofty, but they have a self-identity. They're a yesh. They're a something. Okay, is that clear? 
if you look at the third term on page 10, yeshut. Yeshut <clears throat> means existence. Existence with a sense of self-awareness and independence. Okay? That's the beginning of creation. That there's a sense of self-awareness. There is an I am of whatever. If it's an angel, I am. A soul that's an I am. In the world of Bria, the first world. Now, why do we need three worlds? Well, Rome wasn't built in a day. So the Aishas that emerges doesn't emerge. Emerges in stages. Existence. Okay? Three parts. Uh, the transition. In other words, from an exclusivity of just God's presence, God's being, and no thing but God, to that now there is something that takes basically three stages. Okay? If you want to take a metaphor for it. Let's say shoot. Okay. Three stages of development. You have an embryo. From there, you have a fetus. And then finally, you have a full physical maturity of a child. Right? So in a similar way, Yeshus, existence emerged. First, in a mild manner, like an embryo, not, not much of an existence there, somewhat, that's Bria. Then it transitions in something more defined, Yitzira, and then finally a full-blown independent entity, that's the world of Asiya. Is that clear? This style of the nature of the three stages is actually conveyed in the very names themselves. Look at uh, page 11, figure 1.4. Bria, Bia, Bara means creation, something from nothing. That's what the word means. That's the first world is Bria, right? From Nothing to now there is a minimal something, like the embryo is a minimal something. Right? It's the first existence that its perception is outside of God. There's something outside of God in its own perception, right? Not God's perception. We'll get there. But in its own perception. Yitzira comes from where the word? Siur, shape. Now it's taking a something and it's shaping it. Something that pre-existed entity and is giving now more identity. It's developing it, becoming more defined, right? You take the clay that's a piece of clay and now you give it shape and you made it into a pot, right? That's in the very word itself. And then finally, asiya means the completing a task, the doing of it, the done of it, if you will, even. Right, and that means a world that is complete, independent, and self-awareness emerges. That's like the complete child that's ready now to emerge from the womb. Is that clear? So the different names convey the different stages of the development of the existence. However, all three worlds have something similar. What is it? What's the similar similarity between them? They have all a sense of their own identity separate from God by varying degrees. Is that clear? Independent entity, world of separation, absence of the divine name. Clear. This heavy-duty stuff over here is Kabbalah. I told you, you're going to be a mystic after uh, six weeks over here. So, you know, if you need a coffee, take a coffee. <laughs> need someone to give you a little wake-up call? Just tell me. <laughs> yes, dear. Well, in the first stage was creation, but he, uh, they compare it to creation of the beginning uh, when the child, the person getting the child. But it doesn't talk about two things that bring it together, which is an egg and the semen. 
there that's before. a metaphor. Metaphor is to use a metaphor for what the purpose of what you want to bring out, right? That's 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 not the the point here, but that's a good point, but not for now. That, that's a that that is before your your top. That's not a metaphor for now. That's not today's metaphor. <laughs> That'll be yeah. You gotta wait for you gotta wait for that metaphor. Ah, 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 uh, 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 uh. You have to wait. All good things come for people who wait for them at the right time. <laughs> it'll come. It'll come. It's uh, you're correct in what you're saying, but that's not. We got to stay present where we are, right? We're in bia. We're in bia. Okay. Okay. Now, why does the yesh this existence undergo three stages of development? So the reason, like, like, okay, we get that. But what is causing this to happen? What's causing it? Getting further away from God. Oh, excellent. She's been around the block. She's come to Tanya often. <laughs> it's based on closeness and distance from God. Exactly. Text number five, please. There are three rungs, Bria, Yitzhir, and Asiya. Bria is the first introduction of Yeshut, existence, an independent self-concept. However, existence only develops into a complete yesh when it reaches the third stage. The reason yesh develops gradually is because the initial stage of existence remains close to God and his presence is very much sensed at this level. Then Bria develops into Yitzira, where, where the presence of God is somewhat concealed. Finally, it's, um, finally Yitzira uh, devolves into a Sia, where God is completely concealed. At this point, existence becomes a true yesh and gains complete sense of selfhood. Well, let's take an example that we can probably appreciate. Teenager, you know, Sarah. Sarah is mature enough to realize that she is an independent person. Right? She's not synonymous with her parents. After all, she's a teenager, right? Yet her independent character and self-concept has been barely developed. She could say, I'm not my parents, but it seems like she does anything and everything her parents want. And she just wants to, you know, follow her, their way. That's Sarah. Rachel, she's on the other side completely. Rachel, she's completely doesn't want to be her parents, doesn't even want to spend time with her parents, wants to be with her friends. And there is where she is, right? And then you have, of course, Rebecca. And she's in the middle, right? Loves her parents, but loves her friends, likes the independence, and so on, right? So what's the distinction between them? It's, of course, how close the parents are to them, right? In Sarah's estimation, her parents are so big and so wonderful that, you know, in the center of her life. Rebecca, a little removed, not in the center, not everything but still important. Rachel, uh, parents are on the periphery. Now, there's the greater the distance the parents are, what will happen? The greater sense of autonomy that the child will have. Now, there's a breakdown in this metaphor, of course, because we, every parent wants their child, you know, to have a sense of their own selfhood and that their selfhood is not in the image of their parents and they're just, you know, living in the shadows of their parents. You know, we don't want that for our children, right? So in that sense, you know, we don't want them to break off and that they don't have, you know. But the point being over here, of course, is the closer the parents are, the more you that closest will be that you sense their, their, their being, the more you are following in their way. So in the world of Bria, right? The angels, the souls that are there, Srafim, they're called, the angels, they're burnt up. Why this? Saraf means from the word to, to burn. They're burnt up in the awareness of God that is so obvious and so powerful. Yet, they still have, have what? Huh? Their, own identity. their own identity. Right? But God is the center of their identity. They still have their own identity, though. In the world of Asiya, as Rachel, 
God is so removed that there's really, you know, my own selfhood, my own ego is robust, as you know. I'm sure we've seen many times with an age, with a, with a um, with teenagers, and we've all had them. And adults. <laughs> and adults, yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are the three worlds. Okay, we come now to another uh, language terminology. On page 13, a key term, 1.4, and that is the word bittle. Bittle means surrender, suspension, nullification, a subdued sense of self due to being absorbed by something overwhelming, overwhelmingly impressive, and the desire to become one with it. So um, we might have had that kind of experience. It was a what a siddham of of old. They would fabring, and they would speak, you know, lofty divine topics, and to arouse the hearts of you know fellow fellow um, Hasidim. They would say lachaim. They would sing melodies, and they would be uplifted and brought into a different world. So as once a Fabring and the, the Rebbe by uh, himself told over uh, many times of Rebbe Pesach and they were so um, moved that they came out of the dark cellar under Stalinist Russia and they were walking the streets singing a melody like no one existed but God. <laughs> Until what happened, of course. Hmm? What happened? A Russian policeman comes over. Who goes there? <laughs> Who goes there? And they're in a different world. So they say, Bittel goes there. <laughs> that was their response. Surrender. <laughs> they were <laughs> in a different world. That is Bittel Ejot. Bittel is going. Yes. It seems to be counter to what the definition is because it says here, it's a subdued sense of self. That example you are giving would be They're joyful and they're joyous and they are. No, because they're not feeling self. The joy isn't, I, oh, I feel I'm so great. That's ego. They're not feeling their greatness, they're feeling the melody. They're feeling the closest to God. They were just in a fabringen. They were saying lachaim. They were feeling uplifted. They were feeling no constraints of being under Stalinist Russia. But it's not necessarily a subdued sense of God. No, that's a sub. That well, I, I'm telling you the story. What was what you might be, or what I might be, might be something else, right? I'm telling that story. <laughs> that story was there was a subdued sense. In other words. They didn't feel the, the personal confines and restrictions of personhood, of self-awareness. Because if you're self-aware under Stalinist Russia, you don't go in the streets singing a melody and as if, you know, only God exists. But they were so uplifted, right, by the Fabringen, they, you know, they forgot where they were. For better, for worse, that's not the point. Yeah, should have they done it, not done it? That's we're not, it's not a judgment call over here. It's bringing out the point. We've all probably experienced it. Maybe sometimes in prayer ourselves, or maybe sometimes, uh, I, you know, in a melody. I know, you know, by me, when I was before the Rebbe, there was that sense of you don't sense yourself. You sense the greatness of what's before you. There's something greater than you and you want to attach yourself to that greatness that is beyond you and your sense of self-awareness is very much diminished now how diminished well that will depend what expression of which world it is right the more it's diminished means it's more of an expression of a higher world the less it's diminished the self-awareness the more it is i'm the inhibitions that i have the or self-awareness of what i am then just means of a lesser world because I'm not feeling the closeness to the divine. I'm not feeling the closeness of, of an infinite power. Because when you <laughs> sense that, then, you know, 
the 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 Rebbe's mother tells of a story when he went to go get married, right? And this and this is like nineteen twenty, I don't know, nineteen twenty five or something like that. He's twenty three years old, and they went on a on a train ride, right? To go, nineteen twenty twenty five was not exactly a great time for Jews in you know Russia. Stalin wasn't yet, but it was not a. And the Rebbe is on the train, and to present yourself as a Jew openly, the Rebbe put on his tefillin. He davened. His mother was frightened. What happened? Automatically, she says, she couldn't believe the sight. Non-Jewish peasants just formed a wall to protect him. Well, he didn't ask for it. Nothing. He would just was him. There was no. There was no world out there that he was giving a um, uh, a reality to. I got a daven now. I'm on a train, where if I daven, who knows what could happen. Well, that's you know, that's the idea of bittel self. Uh, you know doing what you got to do and not concerned about the environment or what the environment will tell you. Now, should you always do that? Well, it depends who you are and what your capable, you know, and what your connection is, right? You do it foolishly, not. If you're doing it for a show, don't. If you're real, that's a different story. Right? So, that's does that make sense? Clear? Okay. All righty. Okay. Now I have an amazing video to review everything that we've learned. I'm going to see if I'm going to be able to get it. <laughs> Give me a moment. So I really want, well, let me just make sure she's, I got Revolution it here. Of ego. Huh? Revolution of ego. <laughs> My fears. I say my right, my fears. <laughs> um, well, we didn't talk about the world of absolute. Sorry, just give me a moment. My apologies. Okay, go get some something to drink. While I figure this out, um, hmm. how do I shrink this? Um, Hamid, I'm top right. if you click on that. exit full screen, okay. Okay, give me just no. It won't let I can't I wanna get the no no. So, okay. Uh, what's going on here? Does it want to verify? There we go. All right.
Okay. Folks, are we ready? Hey, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> that wasn't so bad. Might be some hope for me. All right. How do I make this larger? Here we go. Hold on. Okay. Fine. What is the Kabbalah? It's Judaism's mystical wisdom. It discusses the souls, the deeper meaning of things, and the spiritual system of the heavens. Never heard of this heavenly system? That's okay. Why don't we do what Kabbalah does best? Offer a parable to explain something abstract. You decide to build a home. Your plan actually begins with an intuition of pleasure. Deep within your subconscious, you sense the enormous pleasure of dwelling in a home that truly suits you. That spark of pleasure that invades your brain's desire center. I want a home, you tell yourself. Immediately, your intellect grabs the wheel. You logically justify your desire and analyze the possibilities. Your emotions chime in. How do I feel about this location? Am I comfortable with high windows? You carefully rethink your plan. You discuss it with friends and are finally ready for action. Sign, build, What's all that got to do with heaven? The Kabbalah reveals that when God decided to create the physical world, God first created an entire spiritual system that parallels the experience we've just described. In this first video, we'll take a quick look at the final three stages of this system. In each subsequent video, we will climb one level higher as we explore the supernal chain of command. The mystical work titled The Zohar discusses the existence of three spiritual worlds that precede our own. Their names are Berea, Yetzira, and Asiya. These worlds are inhabited by angels and souls, souls before they descend to earth, and those who have passed away and flourish in the afterlife. In Hebrew, the word Berea means to create something from nothing at all. So in the spiritual world of Berea, for the first time in the entire system, things exist that are aware of their own existence. They feel independent outside of God. That's amazing because nothing is independent of God. But in Berea, <laughs> God hides his presence to enable entities to emerge with the sense of self. Nevertheless, the angels and souls that inhabit Berea feel tremendously close to God and are completely focused on God. Everything here is fragile, extremely close to losing its identity and being blissfully overwhelmed by proximity to God. So, God took it one step further and created the spiritual world of Yitzira, which means to give shape to something. This is where the sense of independence from God truly begins to take shape. Here, God hides his presence to a far greater degree, which allows the spiritual inhabitants of Yitzira to develop greater self-awareness. That said, God is still sensed in the spiritual place. And so, God made Asiya, which in Hebrew implies a complete and final product. From its perspective, the sense of independence from God is complete. Asiya has two main layers. Its top layer consists of spiritual beings, and in its lower layer is our physical universe, the tangible, material world we know so well where we struggle to relate to the divine force that continuously creates us. The good news, even as we reside in the physical Asiya, 
Our souls keep a connection with those higher worlds from which they emanate. The spiritual Asiya helps us peer beyond the physical. Yitzira empowers us to suspend our self-focus long enough to sense God's presence. And Berea helps us feel blissfully overwhelmed by God's presence, at least momentarily, such as in a moment of meditative prayer. So, we walk planet Earth, but at the same time, we can be firmly rooted in the bliss of spiritual loftiness. Beautiful. Oops. All right. Let's see. How do we go back? Uh, Rabbi, what are the spiritual people in the world of Asiya? What, as opposed to the other world? Um, okay, those are, I'm not going to go into that now. Good question. At the end, we can. Um, okay, at the end, we'll. Well, if I'm getting the right chair, tell me. No. Wrong. Okay, what happened to my PowerPoint? <clears throat> huh? <laughs> Where is it? It's here? It's here? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Um uh, yeah. Now this is not the um Um, this is, how do I get it to that, that in the proper PowerPoint, you see how it's, um, that I can get, the bottom right, which one, this one, which one, this one, this one, yeah, okay. There you go. We did uh yeah, we did this lesson video. Okay. E. Maybe this goes here now. Is that better? Okay. My apologies for this. All right. Everybody has a pen, pen, pencil, something to write with. I would like you to take a moment to write two plus two equals five. Write it, please. Listen to what you're told. <laughs> two plus two equals five. And I also, I love moldy tofu. Please write that. I love moldy tofu. Write it. Just go like this and write it. Okay. Please, no, write it, write it. I mean it. It's not a joke. It sounds like a joke, but it's not. Okay, now I need everybody to say to the person next to you, I a two plus two equals five. Say two plus two equals five. Say I love moldy tofu. Say I love moldy tofu. Okay. Now take a moment. You got a three and a half seconds and sit and think to yourself, two plus two equals five. And then I love moldy tofu. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. You all pass the test. You can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. Uh, now what I want you to do. Now what I want you to do is intellectually and emotionally connect with two plus two equals five. And intellectually. Do you connect with that? Do you understand that? That two plus two equals five? No. no. Do you emotionally feel 
that I love moldy tofu. No. That's very interesting, though. You just wrote it. You just said it. And you just thought it. But you don't feel it. And you don't understand it. What does that tell you? That tells us that we have three components of our being that is thought, speech, and action, right? Thought, speech, and action. And they can contradict what you feel and what you know. How's that? How can it contradict you? Very simple. Because your thoughts, your speech, and your actions isn't you. It isn't you. So it can, can contradict you. Is that clear? When we say thought, don't get thought confused with intelligence. Intelligence is intelligence and thought is thought. Because I told you to think two plus two equals five. You could do that. But you can't intellectually grasp that. Right? So, zu gesund. So, thought, speech, and action, they can operate in ways that contradict your very soul, your very makeup of your intelligence and your emotions. They can be easily changed, right? In other words, I can... Believe it or not, I could stop talking. Some people think I can't. <laughs> Some people wish I would. <laughs> right? My actions, of course, actions can very much stop. Now, thought doesn't really stop, right? It's constant, but you can change your thoughts, right? You could choose the thought that you want. And the reason is, is because this is not really me what they're called in the kabbalistic terminology is levushing garments of the soul they're not the soul they're garments of the soul just like garments of an individual are not the individual right so likewise the garments of the soul are not really you right they have their own identity they're not synonymous with the soul And they correspond, oddly enough, the three of them to Bia, Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya. Remember we said the way God creates the world, when we'll understand that, we'll understand something about us. Well, here we have that the Levu Shehanefish, the soul's garments, thought, speech, and action, the soul's behavior, which that is, which are external to the soul itself, Right? So that's another term that we have now. Levushe Hanefesh, Hebrew. Right? Soul's garment. You have it on page 14 in our fifth term for today. Okay. What defined the worlds of Bia? Their closeness to. To what? Are they distance to? God, right? That's what defined right there, um, their character quality, if you will, right? And that is the Aceus of the world, right? Now, our own identity, right? We have our, our identity, and then we have the Levushim, the garments, right? That we clothe ourselves, that isn't us, that remain separate from us. Text 6a, please. Bria, Yitzir, and Asir are comparable to physical garments. We can always remove our garments and dress in alternative garments because garments are not part of our essential selves. In the soul's experience, this correlates to thought, speech, and action, which are not relevant to the core of the soul, but serve only as its garments. So in fact, in addition to the general correspondence of the garments, that are correlating to Bia, we'll see a one-to-one -one correspondence. 
if we look a little deeper, right? So the ability to think correctly corresponds to the world of Bria. The ability to speak corresponds to Yitzira, and the ability to act, well, that even fits with the word, is the, the world of Asiya, the world of action. 6b, please, from the Alter Ebel. Bria corresponds to thinking, Yitzira to speaking, and Asiya to physical action. All right? Think about it for a moment. When you have a, when you love somebody, where will the intensity of that love probably be experienced? Mostly in your thoughts. We also see the opposite, right? When does hate really become hate of another? When you think it over, think it, think it, think it, right? Then you become even more hateful of the person. Well, we're going to speak on the positive side, right? In thought, we are have an intensity of that love. And how do we know that? Because sometimes we try to express that love to that person and we can never find the right words of the intensity, the way we are sensing it in our minds. How often do we find ourselves and we want to express ourselves? You're saying it one way and then you try another way and yet a third way. Why? Because speech doesn't bear the intensity of the soul as your thoughts do. And they will never be sufficient to express your feelings. I was just at a funeral. Um, my tax lawyer. Um, Monday. And. Um, his uh, wife was like so bereft. Oh. Whoa. She wanted to speak, and whatever she said was, I mean, it was words from the heart, of course, but was whatever she was thinking was so intense, was so powerful, the feelings that were in her mind, that uh, the words just were like almost come out, I wouldn't say gibberish, you know, I mean, we got the sentiment and we know what it meant, right? But the words can never convey the emotion, the thought, right? So what does it indicate? That thoughts are a closer expression of the soul, right? Of the intellect and the emotions of the soul than speech is, right? And that's why the thoughts will be more forceful and more intense, those feelings. And that's why thought is also something that is constant, just as the soul always is operational, so likewise, our thoughts are always operational, right? As opposed to speak, speaking and action. And furthermore, and that's why in thoughts, you really don't know what's going on in the person, in their thoughts, because it's a deeper expression of the soul of the individual. It's more intense, therefore more unknowable. Right. So accordingly, though, what we think is not synonymous with our soul itself. It's it it um, expresses it more. Right. But it's still separate from the person. What your thoughts are. It's more an intimate expression of you. But it ain't you. It's not you. Speech and action are further away from the soul. They often can't convey full feelings, as we just said. They don't constantly, don't constantly talk or act. They're an outward expression. Nevertheless, when it comes to speech, it is more of an expression of the person than your actions. Because... When you do an action, right? If you build something, you build a, a you know a piece of furniture. 
unless you advertise that you built it, no one will ever know that you did it perhaps, right? But when you speak, you know who the speaker is because they're still connected with the words. Even the words come out from them. Is that clear? Well, all the ideas that we just expressed are here now on the screen. So thought is Bria. It's much more forceful expression of the feelings of the soul, constant, remains unknowable to others at least, and even sometimes ourselves. Speech doesn't run constantly. It's observed an outward expression. There's no separation between the words and the speaker, yet it's not tangible. Action exists outside of us. It's physical and tangible. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Ooh la la. Okay. Okay. Now let's take the next step and discover how Bia is relevant in our lives. You know why the Jewish mother was sent home from jury duty? Come on. Because she insisted she was guilty. <laughs> Okay, we're human, which means we have struggles. We have tendencies and character traits that sometimes may not be the most beautiful ones, right? We may be too frivolous at times, too harsh on ourselves. We are plagued by various things. Look at page 22, exercise 1.1. Mentally identify one trait that does not pose a challenge for you. Then mentally identify one that does. Just have to think it. Okay. So learning about Bia, Ria, Yitzir, Asiya, the three worlds, teaches us something very important regarding our character flaws. Bia's perception is that it's outside of God's identity, right? As we're going to learn, higher worlds uh, don't necessarily have that. That this concept of separation is also true in our personal Bia. What's our personal Bia? <laughs> Thought, speech, and action, right? The three worlds, we have them in us. Right, as we call them, they're garments to the soul. They're not the soul, correct? They stand outside of the soul's identity. Is that clear? That's very important to be aware of. Why? Because once we know that the disposition of our internal character doesn't not need to automatically dictate how our garments of self-expression need to be expressed. What does that mean? I might have a tendency for arrogance, right? What is that called? That's an emotional disposition, right? Yet, can I act differently? I could act modestly and not arrogant, right? Why? How could I do that? Because what is act? It is a garment. A garment I can choose what I want to wear. So even though emotionally I may be an individual who is by character conceited, arrogant, but that doesn't mean I have to act that way, right? I may have a character trait that's cynical. That's my normal trait. That's my emotional disposition. For whatever reason, irrelevant, right? Doesn't matter why. 
nature, nurture, both, right? Irrelevant. The point is, can I still choose to speak favorably of others, even though my temperament is cynical? Yes or no? Well, if you believe in Bia, <laughs> right, that we have a Bia in us, and that is called garments of the soul, but not the not the soul itself, then yeah, I could be emotionally one thing, but in my self-expression, I could be something totally different, right? I can have an inclination to be very anxious and nervous. That's my emotional makeup, right? Could I choose to think calmly and to negate negative thoughts and to choose positive thoughts that will allow me to think in a positive calming manner absolutely right what, 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 that, that's the whole that's the whole lesson over here that's the whole where we're coming to the lesson over here if we don't have the, if that's why we have to understand the, the evolution of creation and therefore how that devolution reflects in me as a person. That's where we're going right now. So in other words, just because my body is bruised, that doesn't mean my shirt has to be blemished. So my body's bruised. Or if you will, my soul is bruised. But that doesn't mean my shirt, my expression of self has to be bruised, has to be dirty. Doesn't have to be. Sometimes we feel that what we're feeling compels us that I got to, I'm thinking it, I, therefore I have to express it. No, that's not the truth. Not the truth we just learned doesn't need to translate into your thoughts, into your speech, or into any kind of action. We can control it. We control the garment that we choose to put on. Where does that come? That's the devolutionary. Yes, it might be difficult. It might be a challenge. Well, that's how God embedded into creation the devolution of the three worlds of Bia that now... I have reflected in me that is a part of my reality. Text number seven, please. From our dear Reb. Thought, speech, and action are merely garments to the soul. Just as we are able to remove the body's garments, so too we can remove the soul's garments of speech and action by refraining from speaking or acting. And just as we can exchange one article of clothing for another, so we can switch our thoughts which constantly runs from one subject to another. This is in contrast to the intellect and the emotion that is part of the actual soul. Demand much effort to effectively change. So sometimes we worry exceedingly about what's under the hood, what's inside of me. Stop it right now. Don't worry about that. It doesn't matter. The success from today's lesson will be how much control we have over the three garments. That's the, uh, the area that matters most. And that is actually hinted at what it means to be a mensch, right? Everybody knows French here, right? <laughs> right? A mensch, Adam, Adam. And the very word Adam is telling us exactly what it is, to be in control. And my natural tendency leans towards arrogance. I can act modestly. Even if my character is more cynical, I can still speak favorably of others. Even if my inclination is to be anxious, I can still think calm thoughts. Here we go. Adam, Adam in Hebrew, in English. A represents Aleph, which yeah. means thought. It refers to thought. Dalid, D, Dibur. What's that? Speech. Mem is maise, action. The human is a, uh, is a compound of thought, speech, and action. Even though that doesn't define who you are, right? 
because that's not what your feelings and what your perspective on life is. But that's a real mensch. A real human being is someone who has the control. Right? Now, just as Bia doesn't, def right, it, it has a sense, doesn't sense itself as part of godliness, the, these corresponding levushim, the garments, also don't sense a, a part of your, they're not your personality. You're just thinking it. You're just saying it. You're just acting it. It's not your personality, right? But the upshot is that we shouldn't take the cue from our personality. We're empowered to live in a way that the deficiencies of my natural character doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Text number eight. This story brings it out. There was once a sage who was drawing, uh, who sent a drawing of his face to a physiognomist, a master who discerns temperament and character from one's outward appearance. When the master saw the drawing, he immediately blocked his face from in fright. The messenger who brought the drawing asked him, why have you blocked your face from looking at the drawing? The master replied, I have seen, never seen a face as horrible person, as such a horrible person before. I saw in him coveting adul adultery and robbery. One shouldn't gaze at a face of such evil. The messenger was obviously terrified in bringing back this reading to the sage. However, the sage sent word that he should return without fear. Upon his return, the sage inquired about what had occurred, the messenger and conveyed everything that he had heard and concluding that that's what I was afraid to, why I was afraid to return to you. The sage replied, surely the, the physiognomist outshines all others. Everything he said about me is true. My internal inclination drives me to uh, and seduces me to commit all of the wrongdoings that the master saw. Yet, I use my wisdom to refrain from acting on it. That's the idea. True beauty is on the inside, right? What does that mean? True beauty is on the inside, meaning on the inside, meaning our action, speech, and even more so, our thought. Because if we can control our thoughts, right, of, of what we think about, then we get the real message of today's class of the Yah. That's the first takeaway. We control. We have mastery over self. Total mastery. Second takeaway is that if we analyze the hierarchy of the three worlds, then whenever we have to make life decisions, small or large, buying a new home, a new job, a new community, coming to JLI to learn, whatever it might be, you will be able to make proper decisions. Why? Because there's three steps in making any important decision. First, you got to think, strategize, make a plan. That's your thoughts. Then you need to consult with friends, experts, and mentors. Speech. And then you have to implement the decision into reality. Take action. If you start with the third, you'll probably fail. If you just are a man of action, but you don't plan, you don't strategize, you don't consult, because you're out there, you're going to fail. But if you only strategize and you're really good at that, but you're not good at execution, you're also going to fail. God, when he created the world, he had these three worlds. So when you're creating your world and deciding what's important in your world to, to incorporate, you need to take these steps in this order in order to be successful. We need all three again. Okay. Text number nine, please. The behavior of properly functioning people is based on the guided by three things, thought, speech, and action. First comes thought. Those thoughts are then expressed via speech to others, such as when consulting friends who understand a specific field for the sake of arriving at a clearer, more acute picture of the matter. This allows a person to arrive at a practical conclusion whereby their thoughts and the discussions are translated into concrete action. 
Thought alone is insufficient. Certainly contemplation with subsequent discussion is not enough. We must bring our plans into action. At the same time, in order for an action to be complete, it must reflect the reality that is simply the third link in the chain following forethought and helpful discussion. Otherwise, our actions will be rash. When we engage in all three thoughts, speech, and action, and in the particular order, we can reach our full potential just as a hierarchy of the worlds is complete. Only with all three worlds present in their specific order. That is the way we need to do, and we need to run our lives. Everything in our lives is that way. Now, let us conclude with a an exercise on how we can stretch ourselves into thought, speech, and action on a daily manner. Text number 12, please, from the Alter Rebbe in the Code of Jewish Law. As soon as you wake up, we should contemplate before whom we are lying and before and become aware that the king of kings is close at hand. As is stated, the entire earth is filled with his glory. It is best to habituate ourselves immediately upon waking to recite the Modani. I thank you, living and eternal king, for you have mercifully restored my soul within me. Great is your faithfulness. This will remind us of God's intimate presence and inspire us to rise energetically. Seeing that the Moda'ani does not include a divine name, we are permitted to recite it before ritually washing our hands, which is then the next step that we do. What do we see over here? Did you see Bia over here? Did you see three garments of self-expression? What are they? The first thing is you wake up. You're thinking. You're aware. God is present. He is real. The King of Kings. You've woken up before. So it's just that's the first thing, thought. It's a brief thought, because then you go into speech right away after that. What's your speech? Modani. You're giving thanks to God. Put your hands and you say the Modani, and you give thanks to God. And then what do you do after that? You wash your hands back and forth six times, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, six times, right? Why? So there are many different reasons. One is because in the Holy Temple, the Kohanim, the priests, they would wash their hands before the service of God. So now we got to go from thought, God, awareness that God is present in your life, that therefore now you're thanking that he's restored your soul, given you life, given you another day, and now you take it to action. You wash your hands in order that you can purify your hands, in order that your hands is where you do your action, right? Most action, I mean, we do with feet to get where we need to go. But hands are the form of action in the human life, that you go and give charity, that you go and help somebody, you go and take action, whatever you need to do. This is Bia in us. This is the garments of self-expression that we have. And we see that in the morning that we wake up, and you see that, that that's your whole day. When you first wake up, what do we do here at Chabad Zichron Kedeshim? We learn. We go into the world of thought to think about our relationship with God. We study before our prayers. Then we go to pray. Speech. We go and, pr and praise, not ourselves, but God. We go to praise God. And then what do you do? You go out in the world make a living, and go do your thing, right? It starts with thought, a mindfulness, right? The first instance of the day, and then it goes into speech, right? Of being appreciative of what you've been given in your life, right? So we say that briefly with the Modani, and then we do more so in our prayers. And then we go and conquer the world with our actions, but it's all a formula of how God creates the world, how that's reflected in us. And when we keep that formula, that's called a formula for success. A formula for success. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? And I was wondering if um, the thought, speech, and action 